What about the biblical contradictions? Are we asking the right question? What about internal referencing differences within the Gospels? Prophetic continuity from the old to the new, scientific validity? I, I think every Christian should be able to answer this question. There's a movie that came out, 2004, and the name of the movie was I, Robot. One well, mention I, Robot. It shows the importance of the right question. And so the hologram of Dr. Lanning speaking to him Doc, uh, Detective Spooner says, why would you kill yourself? You're a genius. You're at the peak of your career. It, it's, you're the Ford Motor Company of robots. The hologram answers that, Detective Spooner, is the right question. The interesting thing about the movie in context today, 2023, is that today there's a big discussion of artificial intelligence. Robots, you know, phasing you out as a person who either serves or teaches or even ministers, you know, are the, are the robots gonna take over the, the preaching and teaching ministry of the church? Would that be a good thing? Would that be a helpful thing, a beneficial thing? You know, what, what will, artificial intelligence do with the scriptures? What will they do with this question of biblical contradictions? How will they handle it? How will the artificial intelligence handle it? So we're entering in a, in a, a new period in human history where this is a possible reality in the movie I, Robot, based on a book by Isaac Asimov. And Isaac Asimov looked with a, with a futuristic understanding of what was about to happen in the future. I worked in the defense industry and in the and the anti-ballistic missile system back in the 70s. And the computer that we had took up an entire floor of the building. It would respond by sending a missile to intercept that incoming missile. Why well, mention the ABM system? Things are not always what they seem. I would be willing to say that the computer in your cell phone is more powerful. Challenging the assumptions so what does Elon Musk know about the right question about robotics, computers, rockets? He most definitely knows that things are not always what they seem. Elon is bewildered that the wrath of the God in the Old Testament seems in conflict with the love of God in the New Testament. Elon, the wrath of God is unchanged from the Old to the New Testament. On the hill of the skull, Jesus shielded us from the full wrath of God while dying on the cross. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? You may hear him mention first principles. Elon says that everything he's done, that he begins with first principles. Principles. Now, what is first principles? It came from Aristotle in ancient Greece, 400 years before Christ was born. Aristotle was teaching a logical system. You begin with what are the assumptions in the system you're looking at. The assumptions for SpaceX, the rockets are too expensive. Possible solutions, reusable rockets, Reduce the number of parts, increase the payload, reduce the cycle time for launches. Electric cars will never replace gasoline engine cars. How are you going to do away with the infrastructure that manufactures them? All the people that, that make a living in that related field of manufacturing, harvesting the fossil fuels from the ground and producing the gasoline. The assumption with the Bible, contradictions, the Bible's worthless. Don't go there. Possible contradictions could be the Old versus the New Testament. Different translations, historical facts, multiple accounts, scientific facts, gospel accounts. The reality is their miraculous internal coherency and in referencing, supernatural prophetic statistics, complementary gospels, many facets of the same diamond of Jesus, old covenant promises fulfilled fully in Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, 
and the Word was God. Contradictions in the Bible reflect the 40 authors describing different facets of the same diamond. The better question is, what about the miraculous, and I mean supernatural, internal coherency? How is the Bible's internal coherency even possible? This is the right question. That means it means everything links together. It doesn't fly apart when you examine it. It's all connected. It's miraculously interconnected. The human relationship with the struggle and the meaning of life, all of it beautifully, beautifully manifested in this miraculous internal coherency. So what? how can that even be possible? How is that even possible that it could be... It could have that interconnectedness. That, to me, is the question. 3,500 years, three continents, 40 authors, 66 books coming to us from Moses all the way to John in the final pages of Revelation. So assumptions, the right question, I believe, is this question of miraculous internal coherency. Not only does it have those 63,779 internal references beautifully sweeping through page after page of the Bible, but there's statistical astonishment to be had. 2,500 prophecies, Dr. Ross writing, says there are 2,500 prophecies in Scripture. 2,000 have already been fulfilled perfectly through Jesus. The statistical relevancy of that is this. One chance in 10 to the 2,000th power. You can see on, on, the, on my chart here that it takes the entire page just to show all the 2,000 zeros. It is statistically impossible. It's the miracle of God's love fulfilled in Jesus. A Savior is born. There are so many prophetic narratives in Scripture. Adam and Eve, sin and the fall, serpent, Cain and Abel, the ark of God. All of these listed are shadows to be fulfilled in Christ. These are the shadows of the good things to come. These are the partial pictures of the salvation of God through His own Son. So prophetic narratives, we've got, the, we've got the narrative of Adam and Eve. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. And what they're pointing to is our need for a Savior. That if we're left on our own, we will inevitably be tempted to disobey God. God gave one commandment in the Garden of Eden. That one commandment was life to them. If they stayed away from that tree, that fruit, the knowledge of good and evil, they would be fine. The enemy, the serpent, Satan, came and spoke to Eve and said, you will be like God. The fruit's good to eat. She looked at it. She said, it looks wonderful to eat. I can't wait to eat it. But then compounding that was Satan's promise. You'll be like God. You won't die, as God said you would. And she didn't die. She died spiritually. She died eternally. Her flesh didn't immediately die, but it would eventually. And so from eternal life in the Garden of Eden, she ended up with temporal life, gravity, entropy, death, rot, decay, came to her. A delayed reaction, yes, but not delayed by very much. Adam dies in the garden. He rises later in the promised land out of Egypt. He rises through Christ, the better Adam. Why? Because God wants a relationship with his people. Not only that, her sons, after that fall from grace, fall from the relationship with God, fall from obedience to God that happened in that garden. The serpent, the prince of the power of the air, took over the very inheritance of Adam and Eve, which God had commanded them to rule the earth. 
to subdue the earth and rule over it, to populate the earth, the whole earth. You know, today we, we're, we're trying to shut down childbirth. What God said, and we need to remember, is populate the whole earth. Many people who are afraid of the climate catastrophe that's threatening, according to scientists, according to some scientists, those who are terrified of it, they're afraid to have babies. That's not what God said we should do. He said we should, we should populate the earth. We should go boldly to subdue the earth and rule over it. So yeah, there's, there's a responsibility there. There's a responsibility to, to, to rule over the earth. But we gave it up to, to the enemy, the power of the prince of the air, Satan, the angel fallen from heaven, Lucifer. So Cain and Abel came along to Adam and Eve, firstborn son, Cain, secondborn son, Abel. Abel was justified through his sacrifice of his firstborn lamb. Cain brought a bag of groceries from his garden. God was not pleased with Cain's sacrifice. He was pleased with Abel's sacrifice. Justified. Abel was justified. Cain, his sacrifice was rejected. It hurt his feelings. He became the victim. His brother was to blame. He killed his brother. God said, Are you aren't are you aren't you your brother's keeper? And Cain said, I'm not my brother's keeper. And he killed his brother. He was jealous. His brother had been justified. God said, If you if you just do what's right, you'll be okay. He spent his life like that, a victim. All God said to him was, just do what's right. Don't be a victim. You, you can be justified, but you can't walk through life blaming your brother for everything, killing your brother when you get angry enough. That's not the way we live. That's not way you, the way you're called to live. My punishment is too great for me to bear. You've banished me from the land and from your presence. You've made me a homeless wanderer. So, that's a, that's a prophetic narrative. It speaks all the way through Scripture. It speaks today, as relevant today as it was in the Garden of Eden. Can and Abel, just turn on the television set, just read the news, just pick up your cell phone, just read a, watch a podcast, watch this one. You're going to hear that nothing has changed in the character of man and woman made in the image of God. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them all out along with the earth. God is never surprised, knowing the world is hopeless without him. We're made in the image of God. Noah's Ark it's God's ark for mankind, a foreshadowing of Christ, the better ark. So what does God do? Well, he's got a rescue. So the first rescue was Noah and his family. And when Noah heard God, nobody else on earth was hearing God. When Noah heard God, he said, Lord, tell me what to do. The Lord said, build an ark. It's going to be hundreds of feet long. 75 feet high. It's going to have three floors in it. You're going to pack animals in there and take them with you. Everything else is going to die. They built the ark for a hundred, over 100 years. And when the 100 years was up, God showed up, sealed the door with pitch. God the Holy Spirit sealed the door with pitch. And then the flood came and lifted them up. And they were the only survivors. The waters rose 20 feet above the tallest mountain. After a year, the waters drained. God's rainbow came to Noah and his family. God made a covenant with Noah and with the animals. And the animals climbed out on Mount Ararat. And once again, Ham, one of the sons, disowned by his father for what, his, what he did on top of that mountain in his father's tent. From the shame of Mount Ararat, Ham's progeny eventually arrived in the region of Sodom. And so he, he went and moved and he lived in the region that would become Sodom and Gomorrah. Sixteen centuries pass 
before we learn the story of Abram, his nephew Lot, and the judgment and destruction of Sodom. Abram appeared in the middle of that. Abram, who became Abraham. Abram is famous for faith. What is faith? It's believing the unseen as if it were real, as if it were really happening. Believing in its, in its coming to fruition. And he believed God. God told him to go to a new, a new region, take his family, and that that land would be, belong to them, and that all of his offspring, through faith, would be brought to God's salvation. And they would be as numerous as the grains of sand on the seashores, as the stars in the heaven. The tithe, trusting the unseen God, to open the portals of heaven. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice, and the king of Salem means king of peace. Abram's tithe, Jesus says to the Pharisees, the only thing you're doing right, Pharisees, you religious leaders, the only thing you're doing well is the tithe. You've ruined everything else you're doing. You've forgotten about justice, mercy, and faith. You've lost everything because of that. But you are tithing, and that's good. So he, he, he says, do what the Pharisees do in terms of tithing, but don't ignore justice and mercy and faith. Those things come from God. Those things come from the grace of God from the cross. The wine and the bread is a foreshadowing of the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples. It's a foreshadowing of the best wine saved for the last. Outside of Sodom and Gomorrah, he meets that Melchizedek, which is a picture of Jesus, maybe Jesus himself. They share wine and bread before Jesus even has that Last Supper in the upper room. Before so Abraham's Last Supper with Melchizedek, of course, that is repeated in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples. After the sun went down and the darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking firepot and flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River, Genesis 15. Melchizedek comes to Abram. A covenant is performed between God and Abram. And what Abraham realizes is, I did nothing. God did all of it. God accomplished this covenant for me. He brought me into his family. He adopted me. He made me his own. Abraham intercedes for Sodom, wicked Sodom, revealing the mercy of Christ to come. And you know the story of Sodom no more. And that city was destroyed because there were not ten righteous. And the Lord replied, Abraham, I will not destroy the city for the sake of ten righteous. When Lot's wife turned back, she became a pillar of salt. Abraham foreshadows Jesus yet to come. Abraham foreshadows his mercy. Lot receives favor through Abraham. Lot is like the thief beside Jesus on the cross. Lot's wife is the other thief. The men of Sodom correspond to the Pharisees. The fire and brimstone is God's wrath unleashed. No story is more prophetic of Jesus' crucifixion than the story of Abraham and Isaac being sacrificed on Mount Moriah. Abraham took his son Isaac, the promised son from God. Ishmael had already disappeared into the desert with his mother. Ishmael was, was the attempt by Abraham and Sarah to, to get ahead of God. Isaac was the actual promise of God. And God said, go up and sacrifice him on Mount Moriah. 
And Abraham said, okay, God. Now, I don't know what Abraham thought. I don't know how he was handling this. I don't know what stress he was under. I don't know if he was completely trusting. I don't know anything about that. I just know he was ready to do it. And as he raised the knife, the scriptures say, and his son was saying, Dad, what are you doing? What are you doing? God revealed, captured in a thicket, was a ram. He provided the sacrifice. Guess what that's a picture of? That's a picture of God providing the ram, the lamb, the lamb of God. John looked at Jesus in the water and he said, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You don't need to kill your own son. You don't need to kill your promised son. I provided the ram, my own son. He's going to die on the cross in your place. He's going to take your sins. He's going to take all your concerns upon himself, all the wrath of God upon himself. All the wrath you see in the Old Testament is taken upon the Son of God. Father, why have you forsaken me? And then finally Jesus says, it is finished. What's he talking about? Not his life, his life's work. The finished work of grace. He will rise from the dead in three days. He will spend 40 days with 500 disciples. He will ascend into heaven. He will return soon. Moses, God's humble deliverer. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement, though the bush was engulfed in flames that didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. Exodus 3. You know, if you, if you look at Moses, he was a humble servant to his father-in-law Jethro, keeping his sheep. Moses had nothing. He'd been raised in Egypt to become the Pharaoh. And he went to the desert and became a humble servant, taking care of someone else's sheep. He had nothing of his own. And God pulled him out to rescue the Hebrews from slavery. And it's a picture of Jesus coming as a humble servant to rescue us from slavery to sin. You, when you die, the slavery to man is over with. When you die, Slavery to sin is not over with unless you have the grace of God, unless you have believed in God's Son. Moses shared that wine and bread meal and spread the blood over the doorpost, sparing them from the angel of death. Moses spoke for God, saying, Let my people go. With ten curses, Pharaoh's power was broken in Egypt, and the Hebrew slaves were released. When God sent Moses to the top of Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets to guard the relationship between the Israelites and the Father in heaven and the Israelites and one another and their neighbor. The first commandment is that we have one God and no other God, no idols, honoring God's name, keeping the Sabbath holy. They would honor their father and their mother. They would not murder. They would not commit adultery nor steal. They would not lie or bear false witness. And they would finally not covet. Jesus combined the ten into two love commandments. That you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And you would love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus explained that these two commands satisfied all of the law and the prophets. Paul said... The violation of coveting will violate eventually every one of the commandments. Coveting opens the door for Satan into every relationship. Moses prophesied that an Israelite would be the savior of the world. The messianic Moses prophecy that from among you Jews, one will be raised up. Sure enough, Jesus, a Jew, raised up, Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Yes, God's Son can. In the Old Covenant, before Christ the Messiah came, God's presence was not possible where there was sin. God's solution was the Lamb's sacrifice. The Old and the New Covenants, we see the Lamb's sacrifice, with Jesus becoming the Lamb of God. In the Garden of Eden, God covers Adam and Eve's shame with a lamb's skin. The first lamb slain, God is a just God. His justice brings either judgment or forgiveness 
In Hebrews 9.22, In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The Ark of the Covenant represented God's presence. In that Ark were three things. One, the manna that God provided to the Israelites in the desert after he rescued them from slavery. It was the daily bread. The budding rod represented God's forgiveness through the Levitic priests. And the two tablets were the Ten Commandments, the law of God and the relationship with God and with neighbor. It also held the budding rod of, of Aaron and finally the tablets of the covenant. All these artifacts of God's presence and the relationship with him were contained within the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, the blood of Jesus shed once for all time. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as the sacrifice for the people's sins. Hebrews 7. The old covenant sacrifices, the old covenant promises, the old covenant shadows were replaced by the reality when Christ came. The old was done away with, not that it was not useful, or important, or significant, or from God. It was. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. Hebrews 10. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Matthew 5. The new creation, through the Spirit of God, through the blood of Christ, through the cross. I talked about that in the last podcast. It is impossible to talk about Jesus without talking about David. David the king. David the shepherd boy, David with Jesse's sheep, with Goliath facing the giant, anointed by Samuel. David with Jesse's sheep. This is where God found him when Jesse finally brought his youngest son to be chosen by Samuel the prophet as the future king. David later was anointed by Samuel as the king, though it took 14 years before David serving Saul, the present king, would finally be crowned as king. David, the shepherd boy, confronted the Hittite giant with the Philistine army, and no one would face the giant, nine feet tall. David declared with a loud voice, this is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell to the ground. So when David became the harp player for King Saul, he found himself surrounded by wicked, paranoid king. David, proving himself faithful again and again, was crowned as the king of Israel, the greatest king ever to reign over Israel. In the meantime, David went to war against the enemies of Israel. He was a brilliant warrior a bold and fearless warrior. He had fought lions and bears while taking care of Jesse's sheep, and he fought lions and bears in the army encampments around Jerusalem. When David stayed home from war, he saw Bathsheba coming from her bath. The following adultery and murder nearly destroyed him until he repented to Nathan, returning to the Lord. Later, when David danced before the Ark of the Covenant, his wife was horrified. She was ashamed, and her womb was shut up, because David loved the Lord. David and the Psalms is such a powerful part of what Scripture reveals. David is surrounded by scoffers, the valley of death in Psalm 23, disease, David and Solomon, his son. Solomon came from the 
the, the marriage to Bathsheba and God called him to build the temple. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married one of his daughters. He brought her to live in the city of David until he could finish building the palace and the temple of the Lord. The whole Bible reveals the merciful salvation of God through the finished work of Jesus Christ. David the shepherd boy becomes David the king. Jesus comes from the house of David. Psalm 22 literally details almost everything that happened in the crucifixion. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. They have pierced my hands and feet. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? His hands and his feet being pierced. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Isaiah, God's prophet of Jesus Christ. Isaiah's prophetic chapter 53 and 61. The book of Isaiah is often referred to as the fifth gospel. The one that nobody would even recognize. He was unwanted. He was undesirable. He was, he was suffering, the suffering servant who would die with his hands pierced and his feet pierced. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Him being uh, rejected, no one cared about him or for him. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised, and we did not care. And, and so we see in those two, those two scriptural prophecies that occurred at least 700 and up to, up to 1,500 years before Jesus' coming and his crucifixion, they anticipated the coming of Christ. Isaiah foreshadows Christ, our Deliverer, speaking the words of Isaiah 61 in the synagogue in his hometown. He told them the words were fulfilled in their hearing, that he came to set the captives free. Jesus stood in his hometown synagogue to read the words of Isaiah from the scroll. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free. Jesus was declaring the good news of the kingdom of God. The Last Supper foreshadows the cross. The Last Supper, which Jesus shares with his, his disciples in the upper room, we see the best wine, say, for last. That, that Melchizedek wine was wonderful. That Melchizedek wine with Abram was amazing. This is my body, which is broken for you. And he took the wine and said, This is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins, a new covenant in my blood. Take and eat in remembrance of me. That was a special meal, a covenantal meal, but it was not the same as the blood of Jesus. And the blood of Jesus becomes that best wine, say, for last. Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part in me. And he meant that in describing the, the hunger and thirst after him that would follow us in our relationship with him, that we would want to devour him all that he is. We want to know him, all that he is. He meant that we would share that last supper in remembrance of him and what he accomplished on the cross, the finished work of grace over our lives. So Jesus was silent. He was tried 
by the religious and by the civil authorities. Pilate said, so you're a king. Jesus responded, you say I'm a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. The complementary Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, give us a full picture of who Jesus is, therefore, who the Father is in heaven. So, complementary Gospels, this is also very close to the question that you are asking in coming to this podcast. You said, what about all the contradictions? Well, one of the places you might imagine contradictions is in the Gospels themselves, because the Gospel writers come at Jesus' life from very different perspectives. Who is Christ? Who is Christ is one of the ways. Matthew, Christ is the king. Mark, who wrote the second wrote the gospel, Christ is the servant of all. The third, Luke, Christ is the man. He was both man and God simultaneously. He was fully man, he was fully God. John said, Christ is God. Which genealogy? Which genealogy? You know what a genealogy is? There's a lot of genealogy sites now you can, you can go into and see where your family came from. So which genealogy is applying in these Gospels? Matthew's Gospel, genealogy of the king. Mark's Gospel, no genealogy mentioned. Luke's Gospel, the genealogy of man. John's Gospel, the genealogy of God. Which part of the body? Um, represents which body part? How, what does Jesus kind of represent throughout this gospel? How, how does he reveal himself? Which body part, as, as this matrix shows? In Matthew, he's the mouth speaking. He's the tongue. He's the mouth speaking. In Mark, he's the hands and feet that co- accomplishes things. In Luke, he's the mind, the mind of Christ. In John, He's the heart of God. In, my, in, in John, he's the heart of the matter. He's the one who sees the heart, and he is the heart of God. He reveals the heart of God. Let's skip to the ending. Uh, skip to the ending. If you wanted to look at the end of the gospel, what was the kind of the final uh, summation of the gospel, the kind of final message of the gospel? Matthew's gospel, the final skipping to the ending, resurrection of Christ. Mark, ascension of Christ. Luke, the promise of the Holy Spirit to come. Don't go anywhere without the Holy Spirit. Don't leave the city of Jerusalem without the gifts of the Spirit, without the power of the Spirit, the the empowerment, the indwelling Spirit of God. Don't leave without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John, the promise that he is going to return, that Christ is going to return to receive his church out of the earth, out of the world. What's the challenge? So the challenge presented in Matthew's Gospel is to submit to Christ as Lord. In Mark, it's to serve as Christ served. In Luke, the challenge is to walk in his footsteps. In John, the challenge is to believe in him. Believing in him, that's the work of the kingdom. That's what God requires. If you want to know what the work of the kingdom is, is to believe in the Son whom he sent. Who is the target audience? The target audience. Everything that's written has an audience. Right now, this podcast has an audience, an audience expectation, people that will be listening. Maybe I'm speaking to more than one audience, but there's a general general idea that a certain kind of audience is going to be listening. So the target audience for Matthew was the Jewish Christians, the people who had been expecting Christ to come, this Messiah to come. Mark's gospel, it was... It was in the condensed version, uh, invisible. In Luke's gospel, it was the Gentile Christians. In John's gospel, it was all the believers. What's the purpose of the gospel account? The purpose of the gospel of Matthew, making disciples. The purpose of the gospel of Mark, making disciples. The purpose of the gospel of Luke, making disciples. The purpose of John's gospel, making disciples converts. Disciples, that's the believer being developed and matured. Converts, that's 
the evangelistic view that John had, wanting someone to come out of unbelief into belief, to see that Christ is God and come to believe. Like the thief on the cross that I covered in the last podcast. The thief, one side of Jesus, sees who Jesus is. He sees that He's the Son of God. He sees that He can forgive sins. He sees that He's going to enter into His kingdom. He sees that He can save. He sees that and He grasps that. And Jesus promises that he'll be with him in paradise. So that's the convert moments, hours certainly, before he died on that cross next to Jesus. He came to faith. That's the convert. So the fifth section is the astonishing scientific knowledge that's in the Bible. So you come to the Bible and you say, well, what about all the contradictions? And again, I've already said that's that's a valid question. In, In Isaiah... Christopher Columbus read that that God uh, made inhabitants on earth like grasshoppers who stretched out the heavens like a curtain and spread them out like a tent to dwell in. Isaiah said, he prepares the heavens. He drew a circle on the face of the deep, meaning the heavens, the universe, a circle. And so when... Christopher Columbus read that. He said, oh my gosh, the earth is round. The earth is a sphere. When I sail my ship, I'm not going to sail off the edge of the earth. And you may say that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Because you know what the earth looks like. You've seen an actual photograph of it. Satellites. Spaceship from the moon. We have pictures of what the earth looks like from a distance. We know it is round if it's in full illumination. But he saw it through Scripture. Christopher Columbus saw it in Isaiah. And he says in his letters written by his own hand that his confidence in going to a dark land to take the light of Christ with him, in his letter, he said, I go with the confidence of having read Isaiah and understanding that God made the earth a sphere. Not only that, but he drew a circle on the horizon on the face of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. He hangs, it says in in, in Job chapter 26, he hangs the earth on nothing. Job was a character closest to God. God loved him. Many people know the story of Job. Job was a real person. Job lived in an ancient time. An ancient time, thousands of years ago. And yet Job knew that God hung the earth on nothing. He didn't know about gravity. He couldn't name gravity. But he knew through the Scripture, through the account with God in the whirlwind, he knew The Scriptures revealed that the earth was hung in space, hung there by gravity, hung there by the gravity spun out by the Higgs boson, recently discovered. You know, that's not the only thing, though. He had knowledge of the oceans of dry land. Only recently, in recent years with deep sea vessels, did we discover that the ocean, the volume of the ocean, is partially and profoundly influenced by the active springs, the cisterns at the bottom of of the sea, at enormous depths. And the water comes rushing out of these these springs at the bottom of the ocean. Here in Job 38, have you journeyed to the springs of the sea, a walk in the recesses of the deep? This is thousands of years before it was discovered. Nobody had a diving bell back in those days to go down and see these springs. Scientists, only, oceanographers only recently discovered these deep springs as we have been able to go very, very deep in, in the ocean. In, in, in Genesis, it talks about life coming to the earth, the formless deep, the Holy Spirit hovering over the, over the formless deep because God is shaping it the way He wanted it with the beauty, with, the, with all the living things all according to their kinds, the, 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 the vegetation, the fruits, and the, 
and the, the animals all according to their time, kinds. The, the vegetation with seeds according to their kinds. It wasn't random. It wasn't by accident. It was God's intention to make it that way from the beginning. Moses wrote that for us. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. The scriptures point to all of those things. Infectious disease. Command the Israelites to send away from the camp anyone who has a defiling skin disease or discharge of any kind who is ceremonially unclean because of a dead body, contact with a dead body. Numbers 5. Numbers 5 is talking about the spread of disease, prevention of disease. It's talking about infectious disease. It's talking about contagion. It's talking about pandemic. Take them outside the camp. Separate them from the body because they'll spread the disease. Do you know that we didn't discover about infectious disease until a a century or so ago? I mean, only very recently in human history do we actually identify the bacterium or the virus that was behind the disease. And yet here we are in in Scripture, in Numbers 5. This is back in in the books of Moses, talking about separating the disease from the people to protect them. You say, well, everybody knew that. No, they didn't. The bubonic plague, all these things, it was happening because of infected waters and infected people, and nobody knew it. Nobody isolated anybody. Nobody read the scriptures. Nobody knew the wisdom of God that was right there for the, for the taking. Nobody understood that. Even in our recent pandemic, there was confusion over what was appropriate and what was good. So this stuff has been there for thousands of years. Global warming, climate change, Green New Deal, extinction of mankind, global panic, science as a Machiavellian club. You know, in one place, uh, God literally m- mocks uh, Job. He says, can, can you take a control knob? Some of the climate activists, some of the climate scientists talk about a control knob controlling the CO2 quantity in the atmosphere, in the, in the, uh, in the world. And that you can just turn the knob and you can actually predict two-tenths of a degree because of the way you turn the knob. And God's mocking Job. He's saying, can you do that? Can you regulate the earth? Can you regulate the the temperature of the earth? Can you regulate the seasons of the earth? Are you so arrogant you think you can do that? And God is saying, you can't do that. You can't do that. God did that, but you can't do that. Those things come from God. Those things come from the grace of God from the cross. Final section uh, before a, a summary and warnings and comfort is the Gutenberg Bible, the famous Gutenberg Bible. By the way, the Bible, uh, over 200 million copies per year published, 200 million, 1,400 translations. Archaeology confirms what's in the Bible. More times archaeology comes up with final details. It's confirmed through Scripture. So archaeology tends to be on the same side as Scripture and frequently confirms very erudite aspects of what is revealed in the Old Testament. The whole Bible foreshadows, and I've already talked about this. God's salvation. God's salvation is revealed to us from the Garden of Eden all the way to the final pages of Revelation. The Bible contains absolutely astonishing prophetic validity that that cannot be explained. The words of Jesus. Jesus rebuked Satan in the wilderness saying, No, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Matthew 4. The words of God on Mount Sinai to Moses You shall love the Lord your God and Him alone. The words of God to Noah. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. 
The words of God to Abram. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. Genesis 14. Melchizedek, a, a picture of Christ in the ancient time. See, Christ was the word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. He was there from the beginning. He was with God and he was God. And so Christ was the one that made all things. The visible and the invisible he created. In one of those final scriptures, the, the words say, take and eat freely without pay, without money. You don't need the money to take and eat the favor, the blessing, the nourishment of God, the enjoyment of Christ, the fellowship of God, and the body of Christ. You don't need money for that. Throughout the Bible, God warns and God comforts. In Hebrews 10, we find God's warning. If we deliberately continue sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. God's mercy comes through unmerited favor by faith. When Jesus stands between the woman caught in adultery and her accusers, he brings comfort as well as that warning. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Loving the truth. Jesus is the truth. Uh, warnings of comfort. Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must take place, must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, famines. These are the beginnings of the birth pains. That's from Mark 13. It is relevant today. The final days may be all around us. We may be living in those final days. Jesus went on to describe what would happen to those who followed him. You must be on your guard. You'll be handed over to local councils, flogged in the synagogues. So that's interesting. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached in all nations before I'm going to come back, before I'm going to come back to receive my church, my bride. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit will speak through you. So for the Christians among us today, remember that. It's going to get bad, but the Spirit of God is going to be right there with you, and He's going to speak. Through you. It's the greatest chance for testimony that any of us will ever have. In our day, we're already seeing the fulfillment of the following predictions. He, he, he made concerning family members. This is especially true in Muslim countries. This is what he said. Brother will betray brother to death. Brother will betray brother to death. And a father, his child, children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. That's in Mark 13. We sometimes scoff at those who prepare for disaster scenarios. We say, ah, you know, you have more faith or you should worry about more important matters. Yet Jesus paints a picture which provides instructions that are explicitly telling us to flee to the mountains. So for those who 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 have taken seriously those kinds of ideas. Who knows? Maybe these guys are, maybe they're on to something, right? So we need to listen to Jesus, not to the world around us. We need to listen to Jesus' word. So what does he say? He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, the abomination, he's talking about the Antichrist, the beast, the statue, let the reader understand that those who are 
in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. It's no wonder women are frightened about having babies. Pray that this will not take place in winter because those will be days of distress and unequal from the beginning when God created the world until now and never to be equaled again. Pretty scary words. Though Jesus' words are pretty self-explanatory and terrifying, the context of these words is the coming of the false prophets and the Antichrist who will rule the world, demanding worship from every citizen, one world government, will be formed. Even the elect will be in jeopardy because of the convincing signs and wonders that will be performed. The counterfeit ruler will be replaced by the one whom God will establish, Jesus Christ. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. This is a key verse for us to hang on to today. Even the elect will be deceived. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is a Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. You see the danger of listening to men? you got to listen to what Jesus said. He says, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time, Mark 13. The warning is powerful and clear. Don't chase after counterfeits, but embrace every vestige of Christ when he is near. Every vestige, every manifestation, revelation of Christ when he's near to you by the Spirit. The more the world falls apart around us, the closer we should move toward our Lord and Savior, who is the truth which the world is either fleeing from or embracing as life itself. He is, after all, the way, the truth, and the life. I can't repeat those verses enough. Jesus told his own disciples because they needed to hear this. No one will come to the Father. No one will come to heaven except through me. That is Jesus. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to heaven. You can't get to the Father. You can't have a relationship with the Father except through me. He says to his own disciples during that same period of time in the upper room, he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When Paul writes that Jesus is supreme in Colossians 1, he says, he came as the perfect representation of the Father in heaven. They're the revelation of Christ, the facets of the diamond of Christ. From the beginning, from all the way in the garden, all the way to the final chapter of Revelation, only believing in the one whom the Father sent can save any one of us. So today, believe. Let's pray. Father, we just lift up this time. We lift up these people who are gathered, who have, who have watched and listened, maybe been moved, maybe been pushed away. I don't know where they are, but Lord, I just ask you to move in their hearts. To, to remove every obstacle that keeps them from knowing your son Jesus, from following him, from believing in him, from surrendering their lives to him. So pray like this. If you're, a new, if you're new to this and you have never prayed, say, Jesus, save me. I don't know how to live. I don't know how to do this. I'm a sinner. Forgive my sins. Bring me into your kingdom on the final day. Make me a new creation in Christ. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus, Son of God. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that all who believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Though I am surrounded by troubles, you will protect me from the anger of my enemies. You reach out your hand, and the power of your right hand saves me.